Tonight's scripture reading will be Exodus 32, chapter 32, verses 10 through 12. Exodus 32, verses 10 through 12. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them. And I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with, great, with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Well, good to see you here tonight. I want you to turn back just a couple of pages to Exodus 22, and we'll get there in just a minute. Hope you all have had a good day, and I hope that you're ready to study with me as we continue our study of developing a right theology. And we haven't done this one in a few weeks, so I wanted to throw this back up there and remind us of why we're even doing this study in the first place. The word theology literally means a word about God. We're studying about God, and we're studying about His attributes and His activity among His creation. Now, what Colin just read to us there is quite an interesting account. Um, when the Israelites, well, when Aaron had created that golden calf for the Israelites to worship while Moses was up on the mountain, you notice the end of that passage there in verse uh, 12, that Moses asks God, and the King James says, to repent of this evil against his people. Well, he wanted him to change his mind because God was ready to consume them out of his anger. So we see an attribute of God there and how that played out in his activity among his creation or how that could have played out in his activity among his creation. So developing a theology, a proper view of God, is the process of studying his word to understand what he has revealed about himself. And as we started this series of lessons back several weeks ago, you know, we talked about the fact that so many people have a warped view of God. Seems like a lot of people think of the love of God. And last week we studied the grace and mercy of God to the exclusion of what we're going to talk about tonight and to the exclusion of God's justice and things of this nature. We need to know the whole story. We need to see the whole picture of God. And so we've talked about his righteousness, his justice, his immutability. And you remember a couple weeks ago, I said, maybe, you know, kind of looking back, I probably should have started with the immutability of God because whatever attribute we talk about after that, you know it doesn't change. God is immutable. And so whether we're talking about his righteousness or his holiness or his grace and mercy or his wrath, that will always be a part of who God is. And if we're going to have a proper view of God, if we're going to live, I would say, properly in view of who God is, then we need to know about his wrath just as much as we need to know about his love and his grace and his mercy. We need to know it all, and we can because of Scripture. So what I want to do tonight is, like I always do, look at some definitions of the, the term, how it's used in the text, and look at several examples. So I ask you to turn to Exodus 22, and we'll look at that in just a minute. There are eight Hebrew words that are translated as wrath into the English. And so there's a variety of meanings, and here are some of the meanings has to do with the nose or the face. God, is, God can be short-nosed, one, one text implies. And the idea, that you know, the opposite of that would be his long-suffering. He's long-faced. He bears long with people. But there are times when that long-suffering runs out. It, it has to do with heat, a heat of the face. We, and we, we've all seen that. We've seen people who get mad and their complexion changes. Their face gets red. Well, that's the concept behind God's wrath. His face, as it were, can get red. And he can be heated in a fierce anger, as we saw there in Exodus chapter 32. So look here in Exodus 22. This is early on in the development of the Israelite nation. They've, they've received the law back in Exodus chapter 20. And this is just further, um, further parts of the law that fall under those what we call the Ten Commandments. Exodus 22, 22. Ye shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If thou afflict them in any wise, and they cry out 
and they cry at all unto me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath shall wax hot. I'm going to get furious, is the idea there. And I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. One of the things that we see throughout the Old Testament in passages like this is God never wanted Israel to forget where they came from. You know, it all started with his selection of Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and then Jacob's children, and Joseph, and Joseph's two children, Ephraim and Manasseh, and then the development of the nation, or the, rather the growth of the nation in Egyptian captivity in Exodus chapters 1 and 2. But they were slaves for hundreds of years. And so they knew what it was like to be, let's say, widowed and fatherless. And he, he never wanted his people to abuse those types of things. He didn't want them to abuse any people, but he certainly didn't want them taking advantage of people who were in a, in a difficult situation. Oftentimes people who were poor and couldn't, couldn't help themselves. And there are provisions throughout the law of Moses for, for the Israelites to, to take care of those who were in need. And you know we see that same principle in the New Testament as well. God's people helping those who were in need. All right, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy 11, verses 16 and 17. The book of Deuteronomy could really be summed up as um, the choice between life and death for the Israelites. Moses reestablishing the covenant or reminding the people of the covenant before he dies and reminding them of all the laws that are there. Deuteronomy eleven sixteen. Take heed to yourselves that your heart... Be not deceived, and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you. You notice, so the, part of the definition of this word wrath in the Old Testament is heat. Well, you notice the language here, kind of the play on words. His heat, or his, his wrath is going to be kindled. Well, what do you kindle? That's how you build a fire, isn't it? Well, that's the picture here of God's wrath. It's going to be kindled against you, and he shut up the heavens that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Their behavior towards others could produce the wrath of God and then the consequences that would follow. All right, and then finally, turn over to 2 Kings chapter 23. Now, obviously, this is quite a bit later on. In fact, towards the end of Israel as a nation. Exodus and Deuteronomy are the beginning. 2 Kings is the end. This is during the reign of Josiah. One of the few good kings of the southern kingdom of Israel, a reformer king who's trying to get things back on track, we could say, in Judah. And he, he institutes a lot of reforms. Um, you could, starting in chapter 22 here in 2 Kings, and also, of course, 2 Chronicles records all this, but many reforms, a lot of good things are going on here. But how many hundreds of years had it been that Israel, southern and northern Israel, were unfaithful to God and forsook the covenant and worshipped idols. Josiah is doing good, notwithstanding, verse 26. The Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. Manasseh is the... You look back at it, if I'm not mistaken, Josiah is Manasseh's grandson. Manasseh reigned for 55 years, had the longest reign of all the kings, and he was, you might say, the worst of them all uh, in Judah. And he had provoked the Lord, and it's like there's no, there's no going back now. You can have reformation and restoration, and that's good, but there's only a remnant of you that's going to be saved. The nation's going down. It's too late. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight as I have removed Israel and will cast off this city, Jerusalem, which I have chosen and the house which I said, my name shall be there. God's wrath. Again, good things were going on, but it was I, I, one of the things that teaches me is that there can get to there can get a point with people that it's too late. A nation and it was too late for that nation, even in the sight of the reformations of Josiah. So there, now there are many, many passages in your Old Testament, but I thought I'd just show you a couple um, discussing the wrath of God. Now, you turn to the pages of the New Testament, and there are three Greek words that are translated as wrath into English, and it's a violent passion or motion of the mind, utter abhorrence to, and grief over sin. 
And oftentimes in your New Testament, that's precisely what it's connected to. Sin. Grief over sin. And you read through the Old Testament. And why was God angry with his people? Because they sinned. Because they might abuse, remember, the fatherless and the orphans. Or, or rather, the fatherless and the widows. They would go off into, into um, idolatry. They would worship a golden calf. So it's always this wrath is related to sin. So a couple of passages. In fact, Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. Both of those passages are written to this church in Jerusalem. That's the book of Hebrews. It's written to the church in Jerusalem. And really the whole book looks at Israel of old and, and brings it for the purposes of showing the better covenant in the new. But these two chapters, chapters 3 and 4, show the wrath of God against Israel. And his point is, you need to be careful because you can experience the same wrath. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 11. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Well, he's talking about the provocation. Look at verse 8. For 40 years they provoked God in the wilderness. And what was the result? The wrath of God. You're not going into that land. That generation that came out. You remember Joshua and Caleb were permitted and those under, under a certain age were permitted. But the rest of the nation perished in the wilderness because of the wrath of God. And then you get to chapter 4, and I know I have verse 3 up here, but look starting in verse 1. Let us therefore fear. Well, Israel, chapter 3, here's what they did and here's what happened. Let us therefore fear, lest a, pro lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. You know, he's talking to Christians and he's telling them, you can miss heaven. You can miss the rest that awaits you. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them because they did not mix it with faith, which tells me that biblical faith is always active. It'll do something. They heard what Moses said. They heard what the law said, yet they didn't mix it with faith. They didn't do what God required. It wasn't mixed with faith in those who heard. For, which, uh, for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. It was ready for them. They could have gone in. Well, and you think about the reward for the Christian. It's ready. It's prepared. But we have to mix the gospel that we hear with faith or else we'll face the wrath of God, just like Israel of old. And then turn over to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 1 addresses the problem of Gentile sin and all of the corruption that they had involved themselves in. And so one of the things that we learn is that the Roman congregation here, the, the Roman church, was made up of Jews and Gentiles. And there's hostility there. And so as Paul's writing this in Romans chapter 1, really beginning, beginning in verse 18, talking about the wrath of God being revealed from heaven, and he talks about all those sins that they committed. It's like the, the Jewish people in that congregation were glad, and they were like, yeah, those people need to hear that. They need this. And you know, there are still people like that in the church today. They'll, they'll hear a sermon, and they'll wish somebody else was here to hear it. Well, I wish so-and-so had been here. They needed that. Well, what about yourself? You know, we need some introspection. And scripture applies to me just as much as it does to everybody else. But anyway, you can hear that with the Jews. They're excited. They're happy that Paul's finally addressing Gentile sin, you might say. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. If you're going to sit back and have that attitude, okay, you're judging another, you're condemning yourself. For you who judge, you do the same things. And we know that God will do what's right, verse 2. His judgment's going to be according to truth. We've talked about that, his justice and his righteousness. Well, do you think that you're going to escape the judgment of God, verse 3? You're guilty of the same things the Gentiles were, he's telling the Jewish people. Look at verse 6, talking about God's judgment. That he will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness indignation indignation and wrath indignation and wrath there you go judgment day is a reality and the truth applies to all of us equally 
And we can't sit back and think what somebody else needs to hear and what somebody else needs to do without any self-reflection. What about me? What do I need to hear? What do I need to do? But the point is this. There's just as much wrath, if you want to say it this way, in the New Testament as there is in the Old. And you remember I've told you this, that there are a lot of folks who look at the God of, that we read about in the Old Testament and they say, well, that's not the same God of the New. It's the same God. And the, the wrathful, angry God of the Old can be the same in the New Covenant as well. And we need to be aware of that. Now, I don't have this up here on the screen, but I'm going to go ahead and click to, uh, click to something here. Uh, we're going to come back to Romans. Let's go to Psalm 78 first. I don't have what I'm going to do in Romans next, but I want to show you something from Psalm chapter 78. This is a historical psalm. It looks over the history of Israel as a nation and their, you might say, their ups and downs, their faithfulness and their unfaithfulness, and then God's response to each of those. Um, talks about them giving the law. Uh, talks about God giving them the law and their for the purpose of verse 7, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. That's what God wanted for them. He didn't want to punish them. And certainly he doesn't want to want to punish anybody today. But we know that's going to happen. So that's what this psalm's about. It's a rather lengthy psalm, 72 verses. But look at. Um, well, let's just start in verse 30. Psalm 78, verse 30. They were not estranged from their lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouths. This is when God was feeding them through the wilderness. While their meat was yet in their mouths, the wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. For all this they sinned still and believed not for his wondrous works. In other words, even though God did all of these things, they still lacked the faith that they needed to have. Therefore, their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble. Well, what's that mean? They spent 40 years wandering around when it could have been just a matter of months to get to the promised land. But because of his wrath of their, against their sin, well, um, he consumed their days in vanity. Verse 34, when he slew them, then they sought him and they returned and inquired early after God. And you see that a lot. You know, you read the book of Judges. You'll see that time and time again. And they remembered, verse 35, that God was their rock and the high God was their redeemer. And here's the thing. Every time they turned, God was there, wasn't he? And he answered. He answered them and sent them deliverers. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth and they lied unto him with their tongues. Remember what Jesus says in Matthew 15? With their lips, they honor me, but their heart is far from me. That's the idea. Their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. Now notice verse 38. But he, God, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Remember, one of the definitions in the Old Testament of this word wrath is short-nosed. Not long-suffering. Yet throughout their history, he displayed his long-suffering. He forgave them. He did not destroy them. Yea, many a time... Turned he his anger away and did not stir up, notice this, all his wrath. Now, he could have. In fact, what Colin read to us there in Exodus chapter 32, God told Moses, I'm going to consume them in my wrath and I'll start and make a great nation with you. We'll just start over. And yet, God turned away from that. Here's the good news. While God is a God of wrath and a God of judgment, he is reluctant to manifest it. That's not what he wants. And so we need to be thankful, that for, thank, thankful for that. And I want to show you something. Like I said, this is not up here. But I want you to turn over to Romans chapter 5. And I want to show you this for the next couple of minutes. Romans chapter 5. We'll start in verse 6. For when we were yet without strength... In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. And the idea there is there are, there are humans in society that we might think well of, that are good people, as we say, that you, know, you might be willing to risk your life for them. And Paul's making a point here. 
you might be willing to do that for good, a good person, a good neighbor, a family member, something like that. Here's his point. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, you and I might give ourselves up for somebody that we love or somebody that's good or innocent. But Christ gave himself up for us when we were yet sinners. Going back to verse 6, when we were ungodly. That shows the length of God's love. Now look at verse 9. Much more then, okay, since that is the case, being now justified from his blood, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. It's interesting. I, I looked at that, how it's phrased in the original language, and it literally says, we'll be saved through him from the wrath. The definite article's there. Well, he's talking about the wrath of God. Because of what Christ has done for us, we'll be saved from the wrath of God on Judgment Day. When you think about what Jesus did for us on the cross, you see the wrath of God against sin. You read Isaiah 53 at some time, and particularly notice in verses 3 through 7, where it talks about him being beaten and torn and despised. And you see in the cross, you see in what Jesus endured, the wrath of God against sin. Now that was for us. You know, we're told in Romans 6 and verse 23, just a page or two over in your Bible, the wages of sin is death. That's what you earn. That's what you deserve. But Christ took that for us. So think back to Psalm 78 and God's dealings with Israel. He loved them. He provided for them. And yet continually they turned their back on him. They forsook his covenant. They worshiped idols. And even in all of that, he was reluctant to display his full wrath against them. Now, he did display his wrath. There's no question about that. But the reality is you and I, well, all of us, are going to stand in judgment someday. And because of what God has done for us, if we obey his gospel... We're going to be saved from his wrath by the blood of Christ. Christ took what we deserved. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. You, you see God's fury against sin when you look at the cross. And you see what Jesus endured. And so we ought to never take for granted that sacrifice. And what it means for us, not, not only now and, and the blessings that we, ha that we now have in Christ, but when it comes to, again, Romans 5 and verse 9, the wrath that's coming in the day of judgment, we're saved by his blood from that wrath. And we ought to never forget that. So we can talk about the love of God and the grace and mercy of God that we studied last week and the goodness of God, but we can never forget the wrath of God because it's on full display in what Jesus did for us. You know, when we talk about sin, you know, we talked about it this morning at length, and we're going to continue to do that on Sunday mornings. God is not trying, and you've heard me say this before, you know, God is not trying to trick us. He's not trying to make it hard to please Him. He's not trying to make it hard to get to heaven. It's just a matter of us, like we read there in Hebrews chapter 4 in the first couple of verses, hearing the gospel and then mixing it with faith. Doing what God says do. And then we can enter into that rest. And we won't have to face the wrath of God. So the question then comes down to us as we wrap this up tonight. Are you prepared to stand before God in judgment? Are you prepared to, to be handed a sentence? Whatever that sentence might be. We know that there are two, two um, destinations when it comes to eternity. Now, if you've obeyed the gospel, you've, you've been baptized into Christ, you've been added to the body and you're living faithfully, that's wonderful and that's what we want. And we, we want you to continue in that faithfulness. But maybe you're here tonight and you've not done that. If that's the case, there's a day of wrath coming. You know, the day of judgment, it's going to be the same day for all of us, but for some it could be a day of wrath and for others a day of reward. It all depends on what we do here and now. So if you're a child of God and you need to come back, we want you to do that. We don't want you to face the wrath of God. And you shouldn't want that for yourself. Maybe you're here and you've obeyed the gospel in the past. You've not yet obeyed the gospel at all. Well, you need to be cleansed from your sin.
And the only thing that can do that for you is the blood of Christ. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 and verses 3 and 4 that we're baptized into his death. And then we're raised to walk in newness of life. That's the only way you can contact the blood of Jesus. It's in baptism. So if you need to obey the gospel tonight or you need to come back, let's do it right now as we stand and sing.